Well, good morning. Um, my name is Michael Schluter, as you've heard. I've had a, been generously introduced. Um, I'm an economist uh, by background, um, maybe a lapsed economist, I don't know. But an economist is someone who can tell you tomorrow why what he said yesterday did not happen today. <laughs> An alarmingly accurate definition, I think. But I would like to thank um, Jeff Fantin and the organizing committee for the invitation to come. I'd like to thank Prabhu for his encouragement. He's been an encourager to me for a very long time and someone I've learned from. So it's a real joy also to follow Prabhu and his reflections. I want to start by suggesting to you that Europe is poor. And I want to define that a little bit. Do you remember when Jesus gave his mission statement in Luke 4.18? He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He mentions then, um, let me see, three groups, people in prison, people who are blind, and quotes the oppressed. But as you go on through Luke's gospel, you hear a lot about the tax collectors, you hear about Zacchaeus, and then perhaps something strikes you as a little bit odd. Jesus is so concerned about tax collectors, and yet he says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him to preach good news to the poor. That doesn't seem to tally, does it? Surely tax collectors can't have been poor, or they were extremely inefficient tax collectors, because a tax, being a tax collector was a license to print money. You just took off people as much as you wanted, more or less. No, what Jesus is referring to is not primarily people who are financially poor, but relationally poor. The three categories that are singled out in the Old Testament over and over again for help are the foreigners, the widows, and the orphans. What is characteristic of those three groups? That they lack relational support. When Jesus is dealing with tax collectors, he's interested in tax collectors and prostitutes and others because they are marginalized people, they are socially excluded people, like the lepers. Those are the people who are top of Jesus' priority list. Now, my brothers and sister, sisters, uh, my fellow Europeans, let me tell you that I believe Europe today is relationally poor. We think of ourselves with great pride as developed countries. That's the language we use. And we look down our long noses at Africa and Asia and call them developing countries because we are the developed countries. But I don't believe that is how God sees the world. To use the language of lenses that Prabhu used, think of God looking at the world through a relational lens. And let me tell you, having spent many years in Africa and also quite a time in Asia, that I think Africa and many parts of Asia look relationally rich compared to Europe. So what are some of the um, symptoms of our relational poverty? Let me give you some examples. I think we are poor in our financial relationships or non-relationships because we put our money in the banks or the pension funds and it goes through from a pension fund to a fund manager and then into a company or into a trust or a unit trust, which then invest it further. We really have no idea where the money is used. There is enormous relational distance between the provider of the money and the user of the funds. That huge distance is a symptom of relational poverty. Money is meant to be a form of social glue. Didn't Jesus say in Luke 16, use your money so that when it's a thing of the past, you may have friends for yourself in heaven. Use money to make friends. Money is meant to be about creating relationships. But we've designed a system where with our money, we have no idea who uses it and there is no social glue. We are poor in our political relationships. Maybe we feel disempowered, but we feel relationally distant 
from the decisions which affect our lives. Um, in the European elections in Britain, we're lucky if we get a 30% turnout to elect our MEPs, our members of the European Parliament. I don't know what it's like in your country, but it seems to be going down, not up. Well, supposing only 10% of people vote for the members of the European Parliament, does that make our democracy legitimate or illegitimate? At what point can a dictator come in and say, actually, democracy was dead anyway? We are in poor in our political relationships, and we are poor in our social relationships. The income differences between rich and poor are now so great in Europe. Um, I was mentioning this uh, yesterday, but if you take the managing director of one of our big supermarket chains in Britain, they are earning per hour worked something like 500 times more than the person on the checkout. 500 times? What has happened to our value of equality? When does the managing director of this enormous company ever speak to one of the cleaners in the company? Would they meet perhaps in the lift? And if they did meet in the lift, would they have anything to say to each other? Would they meet on holiday? Well, of course, they go to different places for holiday. Would they live in the community? Will they live in different suburbs of the city? Would they meet going to the same car dealer? No, of course not, because they buy cars at different places and different kinds of cars. So we have societies divided on the basis of wealth as well as religion and language and age and ethnicity. We live in divided societies where there is very little clear shared vision. And what are we Christians providing as a shared vision? Just think of the individuals who are relationally poor today. People who are depressed. One in eight people in Britain are on antidepressants. People who are mentally ill. People whose marriages have failed or are failing. People who don't have children because they choose not to. People who are old people who are for some other reason excluded, maybe because they're overweight or underweight, maybe immigrants because they feel unwelcome, maybe some of the people in our prisons who are excluded, and when they come out of prison, when they've served their sentence, we make absolutely sure that they cannot get another job because they carry it on their CV. So relationally, I suggest we are a poor continent, but I see this poverty also, if we will only recognize it as a moment of opportunity, because God hates the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And if we will only recognize our poverty and become humble before God as Europeans and recognize we are not the top nation, or the top continent in the world, then perhaps God will listen to our prayers and answer our need. So where can we look for hope? I want to argue that um, Europe lacks a coherent and agreed social vision, and perhaps we as Christians can contribute it. But I want to make clear that there is a difference between a social vision that is there to provide something for the common good and um, a social philosophy, if you like, and the core faith of Christianity, which is about bringing people into a personal relationship with Christ. We have to distinguish social philosophy from the Christian faith as such, although the two are interconnected, as I shall point out. So I want to talk about relationism for a moment, or relational thinking, as perhaps a way to challenge both the postmodernism and individualism of our world and the materialism which underpins capitalism. And I want to 
argue that um, we need what I call a Copernican revolution. Copernicus was a Polish scientist who in 1543 uh, published a famous book in which he put forward this very surprising idea. The idea is that the sun does not go round the earth. And of course, everybody said, of course the sun goes round the earth. Come on, Mr. Copernicus, open your eyes. You can see it in the morning over here. You can see it in the evening over there. You can see that the sun goes round the earth. But he, Copernicus said, no, examine the planetary movements, everything else. Actually, the opposite is true. The earth goes round the sun. The sun is the center of our universe. The earth is simply one object that goes round it. Now, we have managed to put self and money at the heart of our universe. And relationships serve the interests of money. So the big banks have relational managers. And these relational managers are there not really to form relationships with us, but to increase the bottom line of the business. So we're a bit suspicious of these relationship managers that the banks give us. What the, this revolution requires is that if we put relationships at the center of our universe, we've got to make money serve the interests of relationships, not make relationships serve the interests of money. And that is a huge paradigm shift. It's a huge shift of the way that we view everything. And I will unpack what that means in, in a moment. And this social philosophy, which I call relationism or relational thinking, changes what happens in our personal lives. It enables us to redefine who we are. If we are Christians, it helps us to find a purpose in suffering and to face death without fear. If we are non-Christians, it focuses our lives not so much on ourselves as on our families, our communities, on our friendships. At an organizational level, it means that instead of measuring the um, effectiveness or um, productivity of a company just in terms of finance, we want to look at triple bottom line reporting and look at its impact on the community, as well as on the environment and as well as on financial results. And at a national level, we don't want to build our constitutions on bills of rights, bills of duties that other people owe to us. We want to think about a covenant of obligations that the community have to one another. I'm suggesting that, um, like the US Constitution originally was conceived, um, a constitution is rightly made up of um, groups within a nation who commit to stay together and live together and work together voluntarily rather than compulsorily. And because they voluntarily commit to live and work together, this provides a foundation of trust which otherwise is missing at a national level. Now, relationism is a social philosophy. And what we have found in Britain, in public discourse, and I think you've probably found this widely across Europe, is that if you go and argue for something because you say, this is what Christians believe, this is what the Bible says, basically the media screen you out. They don't want to know. I ran a campaign in Britain called the Keep Sunday Special Campaign, which was about keeping Sunday a special day, and we managed to defeat Mrs. Thatcher, I think the only defeat she ever had in Parliament. But the argument in the media was not, we must keep Sunday special because the Bible says so. The argument in the media was, we must keep Sunday special because otherwise what happens to the children of the shop workers? What happens to our roads? And what happens to our recreation and rest? Things that other, other people who are non-religious could relate to. When we ran a campaign against the National Lottery in Britain, which is now, I think, the biggest lottery in the world, again, we tried to do it 
on a Christian basis this time. We tried to say, look, this is what Christians are arguing, why betting is unhelpful to society about all the gambling addicts and so on. But we got nowhere with that. If you're going to argue your case, you must rest it on a, on a foundation that the whole society can relate to. So we, in the end, we separated out the two organizations, the Jubilee Center as a Christian research group, what does the Bible teach, how can we understand its application today, and then we use those results to inform what the Relationships Foundation, and now Relationships Global, do in taking those ideas into secular and political life. So then you might say, well, in what sense is relationism or relational thinking a Christian, quotes, a Christian approach to public life? Why should I talk about that here in a Christian conference? Why don't I just go and talk about it out there in secular media or political parties? And the result is, the, the reason is that Christianity is more than perhaps we realize a religion which is about relationships at every point. It is our language. It is the categories in which the Bible teaches us to think. So just let me run this through very quickly with you for, for literally one minute or one and a half minutes. Think about these aspects of Christianity. We have this extraordinary idea that God is three persons who are in perfect relationship with one another, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, in the beginning, John starts his gospel, in the beginning was the Word. Well, the Word is about conversation. To have a conversation, you need a relationship. Let us make human beings in our image. The Old Testament is characterized by the idea of a covenant between God and his people, a long-term, faithful, committed relationship. The incarnation is about God coming down to earth to have a face-to-face -face relationship on earth with human beings like us. The cross, the center of history for a Christian, is not a financial event. No great financial transaction took place at the cross, but a great relational transaction took place at the cross. It's about reconciliation. Christian ethics is about love. Christian lifestyle is about love. If you don't have love, says Paul, your Christianity isn't worth anything at all. And eternal life. The Jubilee Center uh, put out a, an Easter card a few years ago. And on the front of this Easter card was a question. Will there be conversation in heaven? Will there be conversation in heaven? Now, can you point to a verse that says, yes, there will be conversation in heaven? Well, yes, there'll be singing in heaven. We know that because it says so in Revelation. But that isn't my question. I want to know, do you think there will be conversation in heaven? Well, of course, the answer has to be yes. I mean, what is Jesus doing with Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration? He's talking to them. In the beginning was the word. The whole thing starts with conversation. Is God going to cut off conversation when we die? How are we going to get to know God better without conversation? Conversation is the heart of community. Heaven is described as a banquet. Are we all going to sit around the banqueting table and not talk to each other? Will there be conversation in heaven? Convers heaven is about conversation. It's about community. It's about all of us having time to really catch up with each other in a way we never could do at this conference. So everything has to be redefined. I'm suggesting if you think of life as a Christian from this relational point of view, whether it's the concept of poverty or the concept of, of development or whether it's the goals of organizations, whatever you care to look at, but this idea of relationships is the language that everybody is talking about out there. When we ran the Sunday campaign in Britain, it was the most talked about issue in British politics in the whole of the 1980s, because the statistical surveys showed that. Why was it so talked about? Well, everybody knew about Sunday trading and Sunday shopping because it's an issue that affects all of us. 
when we use the language of relationships, aren't we all experts at relationships? Don't we all have relationships? We know we do them badly, but hey, we know about relationships, don't we? Now, other religions also talk about love your neighbor, also talk about relationships, so we share that interest with them. So, a relational philosophy or paradigm is a bridging strategy. It is totally true to the Bible, but it also resonates strongly with the postmodern condition and with other religious traditions. So we must distinguish carefully these two objectives we have as believers. The first is evangelism, where we talk about a relationship with Christ, the very heart of what our Christian faith is about. We must do evangelism as one task, but the other task is that we must seek the common good. And when we seek the common good, we cannot talk about a relationship with Christ, otherwise we're back in evangelism again. If we're going to seek the common good as Christians, if we're going to really want the best for other people, then we need to use the language of relationships but leave out the discussion of the relationship with God. Now, you might say, how can I leave out a relationship with God from anything I talk about? Well, you've got to learn to do it if you're going to engage in the political and social life of your nation. And when somebody says to you, why do you do this? What's motivating you? Then you have the opportunity to say, I do it because of my relationship with Christ. But we have to be willing to go out there and talk relationships. But it is a form of pre-evangelism, I believe, because as we talk relationships, as we take people from a way of thinking that is only about me or only about money to talking and thinking about relationships, we're taking them into the territory of the gospel. We're taking them to a place where it is much easier to spread the word of the kingdom. Now, how do we bring this relationship message into our public life? And what I'm suggesting is that we need to transform every world that we live in. We all live in multiple worlds. We live in a world, an inner world that we have within us that needs transformation. A relationship with myself. We have a relationship in our families. That's another world we live in. We have a set of relationships in our workplace with our finances, with companies, with schools. Uh, those of us who have children, I think there are still a few left around, um, or grandchildren perhaps, and we have relationships with NGOs and so on. So um, what sort of transformation are we looking at? What kind of agenda do we have for each of these worlds? Well, let me just mention a few. I think in the area of families, there's obviously a huge amount to do in rebuilding family relationships. One of the saddest stories I tell is, um, which shows how bad I am myself at relationships, is that when I was planning a party for my extended family, I found that there was someone I didn't want to invite. Actually, there were quite a few, few people I didn't want to invite. But one of them was a very close relative, my sister. And why didn't I want to invite my sister? Well, I'll tell you why. She'd said something negative about one of my children 10 years before. Now, how many times had I seen her? But when it came to holding a party, I discovered in my heart I had not forgiven her. We would have a revival in Europe if every Christian was willing to forgive their relatives for the wrong that they've done. When you go to bed this evening, try and stay awake long enough to run through your relatives and think about inviting them to a party and see if there's anyone that you'd rather leave out. How many times do we pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and we tick the box, yes, I've forgiven everybody. Try inviting them to a party and see whether you really have. But at a public policy level, I suggest it's crucial that if families are going to play a big role again, we sort out two problems. One, we must 
give families a purpose. At the moment, families are not thought of as an institution. They're just thought about a set of individual relationships. But families need to become again an institution. I suggest we set up family associations with the right to do things together, to buy and sell things, to take on insurance together, all sorts of things. And also, we need relatives to co-locate, not in the same house, but near enough to physically help each other. And one of our big retailers, the John Lewis Partnership, has taken this on board. And um, if you are working in London and your old mother lives in Leeds, in the north of England, and you say to the personnel department of this company, I would like to work in the Leeds shop instead of the London shop, they say to you, the first vacancy that comes up in the Leeds shop we will offer to you so you can live to be close to your old mother. Many companies could be doing that. We need to think about routes, we need to think about co-location. With companies, we have written a relational business charter. So we've, you can find it on the Relationships Global website. We're going to publish it under the term, under the title, Transforming Capitalism from Within. And we are suggesting a relational ratings agency like a credit ratings agency. We want to evaluate all companies against these relational criteria. And we're suggesting the same thing for schools. What are schools for? The personal development of the child? Is that the goal of a school, the personal, individual development of the child? Is it to help the child pass exams? If we look at the world relationally, isn't the purpose of a school to teach them relational school skills, to enable them to relate well to the community and contribute to their family and the community? Should we be saying to our children, we want you to do well at school, not for your sake, but so that you can contribute usefully to us as a community and as a world, as a humanity? Can't we envision our children with a relational vision rather than purely a selfish vision? Perhaps they would be more motivated in their studies. United Nations uh, Environment Program uh, one of, has one of their biggest programs at the moment in Sudan. And one of the people who is helping to run that Darfur water program um, is closely linked in to the Relationships Foundation and Relationships Global. And he has been um, working on water catchment schemes, dams, wells, measuring the total amount of water required and how it's going to be delivered. They're spending tens of millions of pounds on that water delivery system. What is interesting about this scheme is that in his reporting system, in his report to UNEP on this scheme, he's not only used financial analysis and environmental analysis, he's also used relational analysis because he says whether that water is delivered and used depends not just on whether there is water there, but whether people are going to fight for the water as they have in the past. So he says the key issue is to develop the relationships between the government ministries, and of course UNEP's given money to one ministry, not to another ministry, has that upset the balance between the ministries? But also between those central government ministries and the state government ministries, and between the state government ministries and the local communities, and between the local communities with each other. And he says, if UNEP is really concerned about water delivery in Darfur, it's got to worry about how all of these relationships work, and therefore to report on the quality of those key relationships and what impact UNEP have had in building those relationships should be the way we evaluate that project. Now, how many Christian NGOs are there that report on the relational impact of their projects? I've been trying to persuade World Vision and Tear Fund and these other agencies that they need to report not just on the financial and environmental impact, but on the relational impact. If the Bible is so deeply concerned about relationships, if every word of the Bible 
Old Testament and New Testament is primarily about relationships. And try reading through the epistles, for example, and finding any page of the epistles that is not primarily concerned with relationship. Then surely we should carry that through our thinking into the way that we run and report on the organizations which we work for. So I must conclude. Uh, Sorry, I'm going to give you one more thought before I get on to my conclusion, which is on housing finance. Um, how do these things carry out into our daily lives? Well, as well as how we report on things, we are particularly interested in this issue of housing finance at the moment where we are thinking about how you replace the standard mortgage arrangement where people get into debt to a bank Again, there's no relationship between the person using the money to buy the house and the people who lent the money to the bank. The bank stands us with a sort of firewall in between the two sides. We're suggesting that we would have much greater relational contact if we had shared equity arrangements. That is, a group of people come together and buy the house and they say to the person who would like to have a house, look, you can buy the house off us. You can even buy 10% or 20% if you have the money initially. And then you rent the rest of the house from us until you gradually buy off the house from us. And we've been able to show that this is as attractive to both the borrower and the lender as a traditional mortgage arrangement. But there is no debt and a relationship is created between the people who lend the money and those who borrow the money. So if you're interested in that, do talk to us about it on our book table outside or uh, look at our websites and, and see what you can find out. So let me conclude. Relationism suggests new ways of dealing with finance. It suggests a very sharp critique of capitalism in general and it suggests a social vision about what we want to achieve as a society and the processes by which we seek to achieve it. It suggests a vision for organization which gives schools or hospitals or prisons or local government or whatever organization you look at a different set of goals and also a different set of daily working practices uh, we wrote a book called The Relational Manager, which is concerned with looking at how day-to-day -day management processes are changed if you think about them from a relationship point of view and suggests that every relationship has five domains of communication, power, purpose, knowledge, and story. And once you start breaking relationships down in that way, you can learn about how to build relationships more effectively. And we suggest church life has to change profoundly because the mega churches do not create the kinds of relationships that the New Testament talks about. A church is a small enough community for people to share together at a deep level. And while there is great roles for mega celebrations, for us to come together and worship together and share our youth work together and so on, we need to be clear that a church involves mutual accountability. And, we, and the relational vision, I suggest, will change profoundly your own personal life. Certainly it's changed mine. I'm not good at relationships, I'm a very I mean, I think God must have had a sense of humor to have chosen me to advocate this message. And certainly my children and my wife and my brothers and sisters would concur with that. Uh, why, why Mike, they would say, why, why choose him of all people to, to um, promote a message of relationships? But uh, I am learning by God's grace. And one of the things I've seen as I've thought about relationships, is how gently and lovingly God deals with me just every day of my life. He really cares about me. And I think my eyes have been open to see that because of thinking about this relationships approach to life. I must stop there. I'm sure I've gone over time. But I'm hoping that my brother here is going to close us with a word of prayer after that because I think we all need a challenge. Thank you.